Welcome, everybody. Hi there. I hope everyone's doing well. We're just getting started here. We just got a, another minute to go, but I thought I'd let folks in because we're going to have a fairly informal session here and we'll try to have some participation if possible because I'm not really a fan of webinars, although these tend to get called webinars from time to time, but you know, that's kind of how it is. Um, I would love to, um, love to, well, let's just kind of start out here. I'm going to, um, I got a few slides I want to share and I've also got a mural and I'm going to go ahead and drop that link into the chat for you all to, um, have the link and you can drop in notes, anything that's kind of coming to mind. We don't have anything super fancy as far as templates go today, but I thought it would be nice to have a central place where we can all collect our thoughts, um, which is a great way to run a meeting. We can all visualize what we're thinking, what's going on. It's a lot easier to get aligned and, um, and make sure we're all tracking. So there's that link. I'll pop it in again when, when I give some further instructions on um, some kind of quiet entry time. But... Um, let me go ahead and flip over to my slides here and I'll share my screen too so that you can see those a little bit better because Zoom stopped sending high definition video. Um, all right, excellent. So this is the Magical Meetings Quick Start. So this is meant to be, this is just a one hour version of our um, two day workshop. And so it's just kind of a flavor of some of the concepts that should um, hopefully get you thinking about um, some of the stuff. I'm really concentrating on the meeting mantras in this next hour, and we're going to discuss them, talk about them a little bit, and, and I'll model some of the things that, uh, that I think are important, and, and especially something called appreciative inquiry that we're going to talk about here in a moment. And so... I guess let's just let's just go ahead and get into that. So appreciative inquiry, we're just going to think a, a little bit about a recent magical meeting. So something that you attended that you thought was um, special in some way or that, you know, kind of stood out among the sea of other meetings that um, maybe wasn't so uh, wasn't so great. And um and so we're gonna capture that here on the mural if possible. Um, I'm sure anyone that's in the mural can contribute, drop in some notes. Um, if anyone can't get in the mural, feel free to um, just uh, drop it in the Zoom chats, that's fine too. Or unmute yourself and, and, um, and feel free to speak up. We just wanna kind of collect a few things from, from all of you. I see some cursors in the mural, so feel free to just drop in some stickies. I'll flip over a visual here, just in this appreciative inquiry section um, here on the notes area. So you can drop in some stickies. I just put a few in for reference. Just pop in some things there. And I'm gonna pull up the, don't see anything in the chats yet. What are, what are some of these things that made that recent meeting special? What really stood out? I'm seeing some notes already coming in. So that looks like everyone participated. Yes, that is a big, important thing. Team collaboration. So often we hear that word collaboration thrown around and um, uh, um, you know, it's to me, uh, if we're not on that, that curve of participation and we're just kind of talking about some things, then we're coordinating, you know, we're not truly, we're not truly collaborating. I think if we're collectively doing something and creating product together, that's when we're kind of getting to true collaboration. There's, there's some interesting models as far as how people define collaboration. Himmelman's paper is kind of interesting on that front. If anyone wants to jot that down and come back, no PowerPoint. That's fascinating. Um, uh, I once had a mentor that got, uh, that got fired from his company that he founded. And one of the reasons they cited was because he outlawed PowerPoint, which is hilarious. And this is like back in the 80s. So this is like a, a, while, a while ago. Um, it's interactive. Everyone felt relaxed. Yeah, some of, these, some of these things are going to show up in our meeting mantras for sure. 
Um, no memory of a magical meeting. Well, hopefully I'll give you some tips that you can start to uh, disseminate some of these things and, and generate some of your own magical meetings. Um, let's see, what else, what else are we saying? We laughed. Yes, that's one we'll, we're going to talk about the child's mind here momentarily. Um, and let's see, the chairperson was prepared and asked a ton of questions. That is the facilitator's Swiss Army knife is questions. In fact, we have a we have a a, a guide on our um, uh, on our website called the Facilitator's Guide to Questions, which I highly recommend you checking out if you're interested in asking better questions. Someone asked for the mural link, so I'm going to pop that in. Um, hopefully, that was that Holly. Nope, uh, I responded to the wrong person. Let me kick that over to everybody. Just managing the chats real quick. All right, so. Um, Visual facilitation, absolutely. You know, tools like Mural are great for that in the virtual setting, small groups. You know, often people ask me, how do I get people to turn on their cameras? And one of my favorite ways to do that is small groups. You know, you got a sea of like no cameras and you put people in a groups of two or three and they come back and miraculously cameras are on. <laughs> so it's like uh, a really a really helpful tool. And also it's um, it's really hard to social loaf in a small group, you know? If you're, um, if you're in a big group of 10, 15, 20 people, it's easy to sit back and just see what happens. But, well, if, you, if it's just you and Susan or you and Jill, like, you, you know, like, you got to speak up. <laughs> it's like, Jill's going to be lonely if you're not, if you're not contributing. Um, so, yes, expectations are set early. And that is, that is really critical. And we're going to talk about purpose here in a second and um, as we go through our various mantras. Um, so this is all really great. And so the, the thing is, it's like really interesting when you do this appreciative inquiry stuff. And this here is an interesting move to think about um, as an opener for your meetings. Um, I think it is a fantastic way for people to kind of focus on what things have worked in the past. And can we, can we elevate those things or really lean into those things versus this mode of kind of always thinking about well, what's wrong? Let's go fix the things that are wrong. Like the, you know, the, there's so many blog posts, there's so much rhetoric out there about like, oh, this meeting's broken or this should have been an email, blah, 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 just complaining, complaining. And, um, but there's, there, there's actually lots of potential out there if we just like really paid attention to well, what are the things, what are the moments at work that we enjoy and how do we craft, how do we duplicate those moments? How do we have more of that? And it's not just about meetings, it's, it's about any anything we enjoy. It could, it could be about even our personal lives. Appreciative inquiries is a really powerful tool to, um, to add to our tool belt. It's not not saying that's the only way we we need to look at things from all different kinds of angles but we if we're not including this in our discussions with our teammates or those around us um one should definitely consider it um so let's take a look here now at the um well i'm going to flip over real quick to the slides i know people talked about no powerpoints but i do want to frame some stuff and give you all some context and then we'll get into some some conversations about these mantras here in the mural so my name is Douglas, and I design magical meetings. And the reason I design magical meetings is because I, um, you know, I had this this career as a CTO, uh, which is chief technology officer for for a lot of different startups, which is kind of a strange background to have for someone who is a, now a facilitator and, and runs a facilitation agency. But um, as a leader of engineers and designers and product people. I got really curious about what, you know, created more effective teams and created more effective collaboration and teamwork. And there was a lot of different tools and methodologies. Um, early on, there was extreme programming and then, uh, and then, you know, agile and scrum and lean and design sprints. So all this stuff always fascinated me. And then you kind of couple this with just kind of, I would say, um, non-productive behavior that often can be rampant in, in, in certain cultures and certain companies. And I think the thing that the, 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 the needle, the straw that broke the camel's back was when I was at my most recent startup, which interestingly enough, had paved the way for some intros and the, you know, the, the design team at Google Ventures, which led to more kind of curiosity around 
design sprints and facilitation, but also taught me some really strong lessons around how not to build a meeting culture because the CEO used meetings as like a, a, a as like a power dynamic. You know, like who got invited and who didn't get invited was was like a very clear signal as that how he was feeling about you as an individual and like what was going on at that time. And so often, you know, I, I had my designer put this graphic together because it's like that's how I felt this way quite often. You know, I was like by myself looking at uh, like, oh, what's happening over there and knowing that whatever was happening over there was going to directly influence me, right? Like I was going to, I was going to get the outputs of the session and, and think, oh, wow, there's going to be technical ramifications to this. There's going to be product implications that I'm going to have to deal with. And this, this is not, this is not good. So that led me on a quest and ultimately, you know, we got to magical meetings and, um, if you're curious to dig in more after today, there's a lot of free resources at magicalmeetings.com. And it's actually gonna re redirect you to voltagecontrol.com, which is my agency, but it's gonna deep redirect you into the Magical Meetings content. There's a, there's a quick guide that's all the resources in, in, the, in the book, as well as the, 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 um, the mural templates that and we have PDF for, and Miro versions as well. But these are the templates that kind of help you go through the content. And I'll be kind of explaining those at a high level today. But our main, um, the main kind of bulk of what we're going to be diving into are the meeting mantras. And these are kind of the, the codes of conduct, if you will, of how to encourage and foster better meetings. And so if we show up and behave in these ways, we believe that we'll have better meetings. And so as I walk through each, each of these 10 mantras, I've got a section here on the mural and I'll kind of flip back over to that for reference. So if we all slide over to the right and, and I'll, um, um, I will, um, I'll just go ahead and summon y'all in case every, anyone's, well, there, there are the cursors. <laughs> I always love using mural big groups like this because the, it's just lots, it's pretty festive with all the cursors and, um, whatnot. But, um, I can also hide the um, the cursors on the screen too, if that's getting in the way for anyone. All right, so as I go through these, you'll notice that there's there's a little um, label here um, for each of the mantras I'm talking about, and so it's an opportunity for you to take notes, maybe jot down questions, or even riffs or variations on this maybe maybe you hear no purpose no meeting and you're like i don't know i couldn't really that doesn't sound like something i would use at my company or with my clients but maybe there's a version or a riff variation you could jot that down jot down questions i'm going to pause and look at the mural and just see what's bubbling up for folks maybe there's an example um, of where this was is, has caused problems when you tried to use something like this and so we can have a little um we can have a little back and forth discussion like just like we did with the appreciative inquiry on each of these mantras. And so I'm going to um, flip my screen back to, to, the, to the bigger slides here. And as we go through, please do add to the mural and, and we'll have a little, little dialogue. And um, so the first one is no purpose, no meeting. And someone, you know, that had mentioned expectations in the um, appreciative in inquiry section and, no purpose, no meeting is an interesting one from the, if we, because if we dive a little deeper into it, it's not just about, oh, we need to, we need to make sure that like we have a purpose before we start because, you know, otherwise we're kind of wandering around. If we haven't clarified, even if we have a purpose, if we haven't clarified it and others aren't um, clear on it and don't know why we're meeting, then their expectations aren't set they're not um, coming in with informed. If you've ever been to a meeting where you spent a good chunk of the meeting, you know, maybe the first half or maybe the whole meeting kind of wondering why we're there <laughs> and you're trying to, uh, you know, tease out, you know, what, what are, what's the real intent here? And you can't really contribute. You know, there was another, um, there's another sticky that I saw around participation. You know, if we look back over here, right, there was like stickies around everyone's participating. And if we're not clear on the 
objective. If we're not, um, if we're not clarifying this purpose, then nobody, uh, we're creating a dynamic where people don't know how to participate because they're, they're sitting there trying to, you know, tease out how, you know, wh what's the best way for me to move this forward. And then that confusion creates cognitive overload too. Also, on top of that, we can't show, we can't as meeting facilitators, meeting organizers, better um, design an experience because we haven't internally clarified the purpose. So if we, if we don't sit down and make that super clear, then we don't really know where we're going and why we're meeting. And it's really fascinating because often, you know, I'll we'll talk to leaders and um, meeting organizers and, you know, there'll be a meeting that the team is, you know, finding pretty dreadful. And if you talk to the team, they're like, this is horrible. We shouldn't have it. It's a waste of time, blah, blah, blah. You talk to the leaders and they're very protective of this meeting. <laughs> they don't want to, they don't want to cancel it. They don't want to let it go. And then you, you dig a little bit deeper, right? And then on the surface, they try to explain the, the they, they're conflating the purpose with like the objective or like the, the, the product that they're trying to create, right? But like the trick is getting, is drilling deeper into, okay, well, why, you know, like, and then a, a really powerful trick, if you're trying to work with the team or coach someone is ask them, well, what if we canceled this meeting? What if we didn't have it for a month or a week or however long, what would, what would be the implications? And, you know, often, you know, the a prime example is the all hands meeting. If anyone's been to all hands meetings that they abhor, they, you know, they're just like, oh man, this thing, this thing, <laughs> like, um, it's funny because time and time and time, I, again, I hear people that organize these things say, um, you know, the main reason is to update people, get them on the same page, et cetera. And then if you ask them, well, why, why don't you just send out a video or, or just a, a link or, you know, an email or whatever, then they say, oh, well, I'm really, I'm trying to vibe off of the people. I'm trying to like, you know, see, see how they respond, all these things. And then my question is inevitably, well, why doesn't your agenda reflect that? right? They're planning, they're, they've got a PowerPoint, they're planning a presentation, but there's nothing in there to model any, any kind of interaction. And so, so if they're really, if they, in their minds, they think that they're achieving this, but how have they actually designed it in? So, um, so that's where really clarifying the purpose and really reflecting on it can be super powerful. So I want to just pause there real quick. I haven't seen anything pop up in the mural, anything bubbling up for anyone that they wanted to share um, verbally or in the chats or on the mural, happy to respond. Hey, this is Michelle. I've got a question for you. Um, so I work uh, with a lot of different teams in an agency that has been fully remote since COVID. And what I found at the beginning of kind of the lockdown is that people were very interactive. And, you know, and I use Mural and, you know, we have all these tools, right? But then as time has gone on, the kind of participation has started to decline. I mean, I think people are tired. People just seem less kind of involved. And so, I don't know, I find myself asking, okay, is it, you know, is it me? Is it exhaustion? Is it, a, you know, others exhaustion? Is it a combination of both? So I just thought I'd get your feedback on that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I love this question. Uh, it's like multifaceted because, um, you know, we have this idea of, um, so the book is broken up into three sections, before the meeting, during the meeting, after the meeting. So there's, I think this, this can be solved in, in each of those categories. So if we look at after the meeting, we should be, we should be co always collecting feedback on how it went. And if we, especially if we saw, if we noticed some of that, that's a great moment to then to collect feedback on why folks showed up that way. Because asking at the beginning of the meeting or at some time where it's out of context, they might not remember, they might not be in that moment again. And it may have nothing to do with you, nothing to do with that meeting. It may be completely external factors, 
but armed with that knowledge, you might be able to design a better agenda or better experience or, or schedule it at a better time. You just, you just never know, right? It's because um, context matters so much. Um, before the meeting, I think that you can certainly, um, uh, well, one power tool is to co-create the agenda with folks. That's a great way to get people. People always talk about buy-in. I hate that word, but it, 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 it's so, so part of our lexicon that even though I hate it, it like shows up on our website and I'm constantly, you know, telling the team like, hey, get rid of it, get rid of it. <laughs> because buy-in assumes you're selling something, right? And I don't want to like make something and shove it down, you know? This isn't like trying, trying to feed a toddler with an airplane spoon or whatever. It's like, let's like really understand the human we're dealing with and the humans we're dealing with and like try to design something that, they're excited about and the best way to do that is bring them into into it so when people aren't participating one of my favorite go-tos is to say hey like let's let's make this better together and then um and then 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 they have ownership it's like they're they kind of are vested in making and making it better if they're not enjoying it then they're like oh wait i suggested this and it seems like a bad idea so i'm going to speak up because then it's then it's less about oh I'm raining on Michelle's parade and it's like no we had a we we had a bad idea let's just fix this right it's like a, it's just a different dynamic and then during the meeting of course we're, we're gonna that, that feeds into our next one which is do the work in the meeting so I'll just save that for then um, let's say emergent agendas I love that we talk in our facilitation training a lot about you know adaptive agendas or just being flexible you know like um, and it's a it's a nice it's a balance that you had to establish as a facilitator because you want to go in confident you want to keep time and you want to make sure stuff moves along that's part of your job but if we're just going in and checking boxes that we talked about this topic we ran this method this activity that's not necessarily what you got brought in for you know that's not the purpose that's not the the product that that the team is seeking so we always got to have our our eye on that north star and if we think we're moving away from it, or if we think that our plan was faulty and we're discovering it in real time, we got to be willing to adapt and go with the flow and change it. So yeah, this, these really embracing these emergent qualities um, and, and certainly these comments around the agenda reflecting the goal. I think one other big epiphany that we try to generate in these conversations and training for folks is a, like often... Like when you look at classical meeting advice, you know, it's all stuff like have an agenda, have action items. And, you know, I think those are rooted in sound thinking, but they, they typically create bad behaviors. Because when people hear this advice, they go and they make lists of topics and that's their agenda. They go and they're like, okay, at the end of the meeting, they're like a drill sergeant. Like, okay, what are the action items? It's like, that's a horrible experience. In fact, like I even um, like to underscore the fact that agendas should be experiences, not lists of topics. So if we think about where people are, where we want them to go, what's that arc we want to create to get them there? That's going to be a lot more enjoyable, a lot more delightful. And, um, and also in the moment, if things are going sideways, we can detect it a lot more easily and we can adjust accordingly. So I want to move on here to the, maybe I should just share the mural. I think that's like, that way we can just see what people are typing. So do the work in the meeting. I love, love, love this mantra. It's one of my favorites. Um, this is, you know, everyone complains about too many meetings. And then, and then also with all the meetings, like how do you get anything done? Well, if we actually do the work in the meeting, then we get a lot more progress together. Um, we have a lot more alignment. These these things getting shut down after the fact um, are less likely to happen because we've uh, we've made progress together and, and and we've crystallized our ideas in a way that everyone kind of understands the general direction. So the best way to do the work in the meeting is to use prototypes to simulate where we're headed, to visualize our thinking. And if we can create these early rough drafts, if you've ever pulled up a Google Doc, 
like a like a rough outline or something you're working on and everyone's in the google doc just adding to it you know what i'm talking about and what and if you haven't done anything like that i recommend just like whatever your favorite tool is that allows any kind of asynchronous like multiple people in a document or in a project together at the same time um bring it in your meeting whether it's mural or or, 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 you know, Google Slides or OneNote or, or, or Google Docs or whatever it is, bring it into your meeting and think about what is, the, what is the early rough draft of this thing you're doing and how can you simulate these first next steps so that people can kind of see kind of what this thing is. Um, you know, Ed Catmull's book, Creativity Incorporated, is really fantastic. And he talks about how, you know, when they're working on a movie at Pixar, it, they're, they're, they're looking at rough cuts every week and when they come together, they're looking at even even before it's even even before it's even an embryo of a movie, they're kind of sharing it and looking at it and tearing it apart. And you know, like so getting the team to visualize where this thing could be headed as early as possible and what kind of simulation can allow for that. And sometimes it can be difficult to think about what is it, what does it look like to prototype a meeting or or, or the work that you're working on, but um, but I encourage you to really just experiment there. And sometimes you have to prototype the prototype, <laughs> right? Like we're not sure how we how we prototype this thing. Well, just try, you know, and if it doesn't work, try something else until you find what works for your team. But um, even just like throwing up a mural and and just kind of trying to visualize where stuff's headed. Um, and, um, you know, like if you're a software designer, you can pull up Figma or something and like start working on some of the stuff together. Now, often it takes someone with skill and someone who's like responsible for the work to go nuance it and take it to the finish line. But gosh, is it, if it's not an amazing way to just hear how the team's feeling, how they're responding and how everyone's thinking without this ambiguity of just relying on language. Right. And just like, and also just spoken language. Right. Like, so if you think about like the, the, um, the, the level of accuracy and ambiguity spoken language is going to be way more ambiguous than 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 if we're all writing stuff down and reacting to what we're seeing and, and then being able to reflect back on something because we don't forget something because if it's just spoken in the room it can kind of uh, um, evaporate but if it gets written down and everyone sees it then then we can kind of stitch back to it we can combine stuff together and compare but then if we take it to a whole other level where we visualize it and kind of pure into like well what might this thing how might it manifest when it's when it sees the light of day? Then now we're now we're kind of getting somewhere. Douglas. Okay, so this next one, yep. Oh, I think you know another idea that's you reminded me of from your great idea is um, like at the end of the meeting, um, ask everyone to kind of one at a time to say what was the most important thing they learned in that meeting. <laughs> yes, you know, and that I'm is always our next amazed. Mantra different perspectives that people like oh you that was important for you you know it's that's fascinating yes yes and this is interesting because that's our next mantra which is debrief for durability mm. so so essentially um and yes what you're talking about and and you don't have to wait until the end of the meter in fact you can debrief at various critical moments mm especially if it's a longer session, I like to think, think about what are these assessment points that I might want to insert in to just check with the team, debrief kind of, are, are we where, where, where I think we should be? Is everyone truly aligned? Because it might, it might seem like folks are aligned, but once you drill in and just have everyone repeat back in their own words or like just kind of do a little check. So that's very powerful. And, and also, you know, I mentioned the action items kind of advice that you typically hear. If in, instead of action items, you're thinking about commitments and you're and people are doing the work in the meeting and you're regularly debriefing, that you're collecting those things up as you go. And people have already signed up for these things. And so then you just, then that's another thing that's really great to include in your debrief, just to go around and say, all right, who's doing what? And like, and let people just like share because then it's not, you don't have this moment of like trying to assign stuff at the end because everyone's already kind of um, committed. So yeah, the, um, that check-in is really important. And it is, it is really fascinating how language can, um, can skew things. 
I, I will drop a little nugget as well. There's something called clean language that's really powerful. Um, and it's it really talks about how uh, metaphor can can really get in the way of our ability to communicate and understand each other. And um, a really great example is if, if, you know, Jill said, oh, I think it needs to be magical. And then, you know, Philip said a little bit later, like, it totally can't be magical. <laughs> you know, it's like, wait, they just said two opposite things, but maybe they're not disagreeing. Maybe they're talking about two different things. And so as a facilitator saying, hey, Jill, what, what kind of magical do you mean? That's one of the, so clean language comes with the, like, their, their approach comes to like five to 10 different questions that you can ask to clarify the people when people are using metaphor. So there's some interesting tools that you can use if those things are coming up during the moments, but certainly debriefing, asking people kind of where they're at just to kind of check in, very powerful. So keeping track of how decisions initiatives are progressing from the meeting to meeting is tough, but important. Yes. And in fact, here, and then also I saw something in the chats about a sample of a, of, of, um, a meeting prototype. So um, I'll get to that too. The, I would say keeping track of the decisions, you know, that's really going to depend on the type of work you're doing. You know, um, in the case, like when we're working, we have some internal software for running meetings and, and whatnot. And so when we're meeting about, you know, the, the software development components and prioritization and kind of making decisions there we we you know we're locking that stuff and those decisions down into a tool called jira um and we we're probably not using jira in that meeting in fact often we use mural or or we might just spin up like a google doc or something it really depends but all that gets stored historically into the jira so like we have processes that that gets in encoded into so that everyone's clear you know that those decisions are recorded so you know i think that um that's important to think about you, you know your culture of how you meet and then how you work outside of the meetings they have to be in synchronicity and there has to be some harmony there right and how that information flows into the different systems and what are the processes there and then the trick is how do we keep that process as simple as possible so there's not too much overhead um, and someone asked about examples of meeting prototypes. So specifically, if we're talking about prototyping meetings, I love something called Session Lab. And I'll vacillate between using Mural and Session Lab. So if, if I'm just sketching out a meeting that I've never done before, I probably just, like, I'll just, let, I'll just give you an example here on, on, the, um, on this mural. So I'll just, just, you know, I'll generally just have a, an empty mural. And I'll start thinking about how do I want to open? And so maybe maybe I'll say hopes and fears. You know, I'm also maybe taking some notes around like, where do they want to go? Maybe the, you know, maybe there, there's it's a new team, don't know each other. So that's how, that's how they're showing up. So that's an interesting data point for me to know how they're showing up. And then, then, I, then I'm like, I also heard that um, there's a, a new process the leader has introduced. So then, and then, you know, then I'm, I'm thinking, oh, maybe, okay, this is some interesting data points. So like, maybe I also think about like, you know, strengths finder is, is one of the tools we really love. And then maybe, maybe I'm thinking about, um, uh, do they do a, a retro um, or, you know, like a rose thorn bud? on the um on the process or whatever you know and so i'm starting to just jot down some ideas of kind of what i might do and i'm kind of rearranging them this might be better if that came before that or you know and then and then, you know someone on the team that i'm collaborating with could also be simultaneously dropping stuff in and we're both kind of riffing with each other and talking about what's what and we're kind of keeping all the pieces in mind so that's that's what i mean by kind of a prototype right where it's a quick and dirty visualization of where we might go with this agenda. Um, if it's something I've done a few different times that, and I'm just kind of reusing some modules I've already explored before, I'll typically go um, in a straight into session lab. 
And Session Lab is a really awesome tool for, um, well, I don't know why I'm not logged in, but um, for creating agendas. And it's actually free. So um, let me just see here. Uh, so like, for instance, this is the agenda for the, for the, um, for the full version of this workshop. And so you can see I've got my breaks and um, I can just kind of move the stuff around and, um, you know, um, Annie's in here as well. So if anything I'm changing, like if we're in a meeting together, she could make changes. She could see my changes. We can collaborate on it real time. So that's kind of what I mean by prototypes. And you can use whatever tool your team likes to use as long as it provides real-time collaboration. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. And this one's foster emotional safety. And, you know, I think if you haven't checked out the book, um, Fearless Organization, I highly recommend it. It's by Amy C. Edmondson. Um, it's pretty phenomenal. And, you know, the idea is how do we, um, how do we make sure that uh, everyone feels comfortable speaking up. Um, I, I like to tell people, if you have, if there's more truth in the hallways than in your meetings, then you have a problem. You know, folks don't feel like um, comfortable speaking up. Also, if you're, to, a, another big symptom is if you are hearing about problems late in the game, like when they, you know, when they become so, so problematic that you can't ignore it, you know? It's sort of like, um, uh, uh, you know, one analogy I think about is like people ignoring like something, something that's problematic with their car until the thing, until it just totally doesn't move. <laughs> it's like, if that kind of stuff is happening at your organization, then it's could be an indicator that there's low psychological safety and that people, you know, don't feel um, emotionally comfortable speaking up and sharing these things because maybe there's backlash when they do. Um, also, um, another thing, uh, uh, less of a symptom and more of maybe a cause, do you notice that people are, um, are rewarded for bringing bad things to place or people mentored and supported when, when they fail or make mistakes um, and, and how are they helped through these, these things so that they can, they can do better next time? And um, so that's, that's all, all really important because we, it's really hard to get everyone participating if there's this like barrier to their contributions because they're afraid to, to speak up. And so if they're holding back in some way, then they're not participating fully. Uh, the name of the book is Fearless Organization. Fearless because if you, have, if, if you lack psychological safety, you have fear to speak up. There's fear within the organization. Um, so a fearless organization is one that has high psychological safety. That's something you strive for. Her name is Amy C. Edmondson. With initial, her initials are ACE. So you got to give kudos to her parents. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Um, all right, let's move on to the next one. Embrace the child's mind. This is an interesting one because the... Um, so often I get kind of resistance or pushback on this kind of stuff. And the, the, the thing is, is I, I think it's because people's pro, like professional identities are kind of rooted in this notion that they need to be kind of serious, you know, and buttoned up and prepared and have all the right answers. And, and also part, our education system probably contributes to this too. Right. Because think about like, um, we don't really practice beyond like high school, maybe sometimes middle school for some of us, right? Um, everything's for keeps. Unless like you're a professional athlete. And so what if we created um, more kind of serious play, endless curiosity, wonderment in our work, a, it, that, that's infectious, you know, you want to get more participation. Let's create these moments where people 
um, can, and, and you know these these mantras are somewhat in order of maturity too because it's really hard to have people engage in infectious play if there's not something there's no subject psychological safety because <laughs> if they're worried that someone's going to ridicule them for doing it then they're going to hold back and not do it um so it's it's really there's a really awesome stanford study that showed that um this is really cool um they uh tested kindergarten students against ceos on this challenge of like who could build the tallest structure and the kindergarten students like totally slayed them like by a long shot and they ran the study again with like engineers and then with like product managers and project managers like they tried all different disciplines and the kindergarten was just like crushed everybody and then they thought well okay the kindergartners are kind of um, cross-functional right they're not specialized so maybe maybe there was an error maybe our study was biased because because we didn't um you know we had people with specializations so then they created a cross-functional group and of course the cross-functional group did do better than all the siloed groups but the kindergartners still slayed them and it's because the kindergartners well it's twofold the kindergartners had this like mindset of like what might work they didn't have the curse of knowledge you know they they were just like totally experimenting they were also highly highly collaborative the professionals the adults spent a large majority of their time simply with power dynamics trying to understand who was more important and who should be listened to more and who should talk more and these kinds of things. So how often are your, are, are, are your meetings consumed with these like, okay, who like just kind of like feeling out like, okay, who, <laughs> where do I, where am I on this, on the spectrum and how should I step in and step out? Um, and it's, it's something we do. And so creating um, more, um, Yes, it is, it is based on the marshmallow challenge with the spaghetti and the marshmallows. Um, and um, so think about how you can bring more wonderment and more of, you know, how can we, we be more like these kindergartners um, in some of these moments that we work together? Respect everyone's time. So this one's interesting. And this is one that, um, you know, typically in design workshops, um, that are uh, or, or workshops where we do more dedicated work and when we were in person we would have everyone like, put their devices away so we'd say no devices and uh, my friend Jake Knapp always had this funny joke where like he'd show all these devices that were outlawed you know no no iPads no cell phone no this no that but then he had a power glove if anyone remembers the Nintendo power glove and he's like if you have a power glove that's acceptable <laughs> But, um, but the point is, it is super frustrating when you're in a meeting and someone next to you is working on a PowerPoint for an entirely different project, right? And so why are they even there? You know, if they're, if they're multitasking on a PowerPoint for a totally different project, like how many, e how many IQ points are they, are they just like deducting from this meeting? not only for themselves, but for others, right? Because now others having to stop and explain and just deal with this like lack of like, um, I would say impedance or a match. And so if we can't come and dedicate ourselves and our focus and our attention, like we should not attend. And so this is one that we just got to make sure that everyone's willing to focus. And this can be a really great ground rule to think about attention and how people show up. Bring in your best self. Um, yes. And someone wrote, this can be challenging in the COVID world. And uh, I forgot who that was um, uh, earlier. Was it it might've been Michelle that brought up this kind of struggle. And it's almost been like yeah. people, <laughs> people have been waning over time as far as like how much they can, you can expect from them. And, um, and it, it's, it's tough. The, the thing is um, 
that quite often, um, and there's something else that I want to, I didn't come to when I was responding to that question. I want to come back to you. Um, but before I do, there's some nuance here on this bring your best self. And, you know, there's an internal debate because here at Voltage Control, we have a policy, all meetings are optional. And the team thought that was a little obtuse. So they didn't want to publish it as one of the mantras. Um, so that's how this got translated into bring your best self. So the point, is, the idea here is like, if you can't bring your best self, if this, if, if this doesn't like impact you and the work that you do in a positive way, or you can't come and contribute something to the initiative to help everyone else out. If you can't be helpful or it's not going to help you, then you should decline the meeting, right? Because otherwise you're, you're bringing like half of yourself or you're just kind of like checking a box for attending. And of course, like, you know, you don't want to be, um, you don't want to be inconsiderate. So we want to send a nice, nice like note that says like while we're declining and maybe even suggest someone else because often when we know why we shouldn't attend that might lead us to an understanding of who should attend and why so this that's the that's the spirit behind bring your best self and coming back to this covid piece you know the self-care matters um and we can even schedule meetings uh to focus on this and one of the templates that we have is called the what meeting are we having template and that template is kind of focused on kind of exploring the pathology of meetings and kind of getting into like why what meetings are, are effective, which ones aren't, et cetera. And so um, I th the thing to think about here is um, specifically in that template, there's like different types of meetings or like how we, the things we're kind of trying to get out of a meeting from, from a, just a, um, what they can generate or what they can do kind of um, perspectives. And one of those, one of those elements is team health. And there's a BBC report that came out, I guess now it's been about two years that said most ineffective meetings are actually a form of therapy. And if you come back to our no purpose, no meeting and this notion of like, not only does you as the organizer need to be clear on the purpose, but others being clear on the purpose helps them show up and appreciate the meeting, helps them contribute, know how to contribute. So it's not like confusing and, and weird. And um, so imagine if people are feeling this need for connection or feeling this need for like, you know, some sort of like just um, uh, even therapy, just, you know, talking with the rest of the team or, you know, just some sort of like, um, team, team bonding, whatever. And they're just inadvertently throwing these things on the calendar because it's just like a subconscious like um, uh, need or response. Then they're kind of self-medicating. They're probably over-medicating. And then the rest of the team is not clear on that being the purpose. And so then they show up and they're like, well, why didn't, well, why didn't we even have this meeting? What's the point of that, you know? Um, and so if we actually honor this notion of team health, or connectedness as as the reason why we're meeting, it can be really powerful. Because then we stop self-medicating, we stop over-medicating, because everyone's clear on it, everyone's really happy and they benefit from it. So it reduces this overall friction. And it, and so something to really be, be mindful of, and especially in this time where people are struggling. And, and this is something that managers should be really leaning in, leaders should be really leaning into, is like really um, just kind of, understanding where people are at and, and making sure to give them the space, you know, to be comfortable and, um, and, and support them where they're at. Cause it is, it is tough for sure. Um, decide what not to do. I love that someone knows essentialism. Awesome, awesome stuff. So definitely a great book to, to check out. There's another one called, um, uh, hell yes or hell no. <laughs> Um, so this notion of being able to understand what is a no, and it's not just, um, it can be powerful in the moment, just looking through and saying, all right, what are we going to get off our plates? Because if we create space, then innovation tends to rush in. We can, it creates opportunity for these things that have been stacking up or lacking that we can really go do some amazing stuff, but it also, um, 
it also, if we take it a step further and look at creating like a rubric or a kind of a guide for what types of things we're going to say no to, not just these five things, but anything res that resembles this stuff or anything that has these characteristics, any, for instance, any, any deal smaller than $5,000, we're not going to take it. That's a very hard line and very easy to assess when it comes in to say no, right? And so having these discussions with the team, whatever they are, and setting these boundaries and sticking to them can be really powerful because then you can make fast decisions that aren't, don't even feel like decisions anymore, right? Because you've got this really nice like, tool. And of course, these things can be revisited, but this is very, very powerful and can eliminate lots of time spent in meetings, talking in circles. Another one, disagree and commit. And then our subtitle on this is agree to try it out. <laughs> and you notice this one is near the end because it requires um, psychological safety and some of these other things, right, to, um, to know what we're going to try out. And also first saying what we're not going to do is also powerful because we can exclude these things before we even get into like, all right, well, what are we going to try out? And um, I'm a big fan of what I call gradients of agreement. So instead of saying uh, we have to have unanimity, what kind of dynamic can we create to say like, hey, we got enough support for this to go to go try it out. Um, and let's make sure, let's create a culture where we'll support each other through these experiments rather than, you know, a culture where we have to get to unanimity and everyone supporting everything because that's just to slow stuff down and it bleeds out any novelty, right? Like if, if we're, if everyone's just like cramming their ideas into something, it just turns into like um, this thing that doesn't really resemble anybody's idea. Um, and so this one's really powerful. Highly recommend you using this in your sessions. And finally, capturing room intelligence. If we didn't write it down, it didn't happen. And so I'm a big fan of having the team record stuff. You guys have been taking notes today. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff on the board and, um, let's see what we have. We got a note here. So I'm going to flip over, um, how to centrally archive months of research and sprint retros, big challenge to make it easy to navigate. Yes. So, um, that is a challenge for sure. And I think the one thing is, um, to, there's a couple things to kind of reflect on here. One is, we can create war rooms that are kind of live beyond just one session. I'm a big fan of that. So you remember if, if any of you have been in design agency or seen design agencies before, these are like the big kind of foam like boards that they would have around that they would you know push pens into and like they could see the big array of like the the project, right? And so um, we like to create murals that are just war rooms of just like like information and data and outputs. And so at the end of a session, we'll pull those things over and, and plop stuff in. Or, and then, you know, sometimes we forget stuff, but the, the, with the war rooms there. And so if we're like, hey, some, that's missing. We didn't pull this over. You know, the old mural's still there from the meeting two days ago or a week ago. We go and we pull it over and now we have it. Um, the, the, the trick is making sure there's a cadence where you review the war room or you kind of look at the progress. Also, if there are other systems, I, I talked about this overarching kind of um, process that you use um, to track either your quarterly goals, like if you're doing OKRs or something, or, or you're doing software development and there's something to track your, your sprints or your, your software development tickets. You know, sometimes these meetings will feed stuff into those tools. And so then there's this like arc that going above the actual individual interactions. So I would think about how some of how some of this information in the meetings percolate up to those systems. But that's kind of gets beyond, it's getting a little more complicated than 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 the magical meeting stuff. But just just a little note because someone was expressing some interest there. So that gets us through all our meeting mantras. And I want to just leave you with a few. Um, I wanted to just kind of echo something I said earlier, which was the this notion that uh, you know. Um, magical meetings is broken up into before the meeting, during the meeting, after the meeting. It can be really powerful to think about those things individually, like how do we prepare, how do we clarify our purpose, 
And then, you know, what, what kind of things are we doing during the meeting to be better facilitators, better participants? And then finally, how are we reflecting and how are we leaning in our culture? And I want to just talk really quickly about um, the templates that we um, have during each of these um, sections. So the, the ones I wanted to share today are uh, for before the meeting would be, um, you know, <clears throat> this kind of focus on, you know, we've got all these meetings and, and how, do we, how do we make sense of all of them and how do we even think about which ones we could stop having and, or even understand how to show up to all of them. And that's where no, the no purpose, no meeting mantra comes in that we talked about. And we have this template called what meeting are we having? And this is kind of an assessment you can either run individually or with a team to kind of look at the pathology of a meeting, think about how we improve it and even decide if we should cancel it. So a really fun little like worksheet you can just kind of work through as a team. Um, during the meeting, you know, the, the big question is with all the stuff, you know, all these meetings, how do we get anything done, right? And it's like just back-to-back -back meetings. And that's where uh, do the work in the meeting comes into play and we can actually make progress even in the meetings. And, um, and also, you know, if we're, we're figuring out some meetings to cancel, we're getting work done in the meetings, we're getting progress, we're seeing momentum, all good stuff. Here's another example of a prototype that you can, um, tool that you can use in a meeting. It's a mural template for something we call Take Five. And this is where everyone's just spending five minutes to make a little prototype. And here, think about it as a collage or even just a little hand sketch of, of what they see. You know, if this is like, if folks are prototyping a data model, they might be mapping out like a database tables and it might just be like some, some words written on a, written on some stickies or on a piece of paper and they take a photo of it. Um, and in the workshop for magical meetings, we have people prototype an upcoming meeting. And so this can look like the various activities they're going to do. It could, it could just be um, photos and, and emoticons and things of the emotions that are going to happen throughout the meeting what's the emotional journey they want to take them on. But the point is like, if we visualize our ideas, we have a little prototype and then people can share it. And so this template just kind of walks, walks the team through those steps. And then finally, after the meeting, you know, the question is, we, we did this work in the meeting, we gather, we, we, we discuss, and you know, we're kind of in the situation of now what? And it, this is really this debrief for durability piece. And I love that question that came up earlier around, you know, are we taking the time to ask people, what do you think? <laughs> how, did, how, did this, how did this end for you or what's next for you? And um, um, the magical storing spine is a, is a um, tool and template for creating a narrative about a meeting and about a workshop and being able to share that out with a broader team. This can be really helpful to, to work, walk through quickly with the team as a debrief tool to say, all right, what happened and how are we going to talk about it? And then finally, the, the real um, kind of granddaddy of all of these is the meeting system redesign. And this is about assessing your meeting culture and how people are thinking about meetings more broadly in the organization. This can be really helpful to bring in the entire team or multiple teams um, I have seen people fill it out individually, but really powerful as a dialogue about meetings in general at your, at your company. Um, all these templates are available at magicalmeetings.com and um, um, invite you to check those out and um, they're all free. And it, it was a pleasure having you today. Um, and um, we've got a couple minutes left and I have a little time after this. So if anyone has questions, I'm happy to kind of stick around and chat and um, whatnot. But I um, want to just say thank you all for, for spending your time with me. I know your time is valuable and, it's, and it means a lot. So, so, so thank you. Thank you. Hey, Doug, um, this is Phil. Yeah. Um, I had a question around, you know, I, I'm thinking as you're going through, you know, all of these different mantras and, um, you know, I guess I'd like your opinion on how necessary you feel like it is to have facilitation for these meetings. Like, so 
Mm. It's one thing to have like, you know, you definitely need facilitation for a big workshop and things like that. And I'm just thinking through like, man, it seems like to pull a lot of this stuff off and have really magical meetings, like they need to be facilitated. Right. And they need, and you need to have that sort of expertise in the room. I would just like to hear your thoughts on like, do you feel like that's necessary or is it like possible to like, just, you know, set these meetings up in a way that you don't really need expert facilitation to pull it off as long as everyone kind of knows the ground rules. Yeah. So there's a lot there for sure. Um, the, <laughs> we have a, in the, in the book, we kind of, we start off and we say there's no such thing as bad meetings, just bad facilitators. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and we go on to say like, if you don't think of yourself as a facilitator um, and you're having and you're scheduling meetings, then you're probably a bad facilitator because you're not taking the job seriously, right? And I think that's part, that's that's a big part of the problem. It's like, no one's been given a manual on how to do this stuff, but like they've been told they have to like run meetings and so they just do it, right? <laughs> um, and then and then also, I think you're hitting on a big, a big issue around the specifically the facilitation skills because when, when you go and read Harvard Business Review articles about how to have good meetings, like there's a lot of good stuff there, but very little, very, very little of it focus, if any, focuses on good facilitation, right? And and so now to get to your question specifically, there's I think of it as like a maturity curve, right? Um, if you have a organization that's kind of immature on the facilitation curve, maybe there's lack of psychological safety, these kinds of things. Bringing in an outsider is going to really help be the glue and start creating some of that cohesion, maybe even bring in some tools to start assessing and pointing some of these things out. You know, if the CEO is part of the problem and the CEO is the one that's running the meeting, like that's like a real difficult dynamic to get around, right? Um, and so that's where an outsider can really come into play. If the organization is pretty sophisticated, sometimes they just need a little bit of, um, of, training a little bit of direction and then some of this stuff kind of starts to percolate and grow on its own right um in fact a lot of times when we train people on facilitation and different methods and um and tools we'll we'll come back into an organization that we haven't visited in a while because we, we, we usually work with groups like long term right um there might be a short-term engagement then we'll come back in six months later or a year later or something and it's really uncanny because we'll come in and we'll see teams doing things, but they're like, don't know what they're called. Like they don't know, they don't have the, the vernacular or, or, you know, or, or, um, or the language, but they're doing it. And it's, it's really cool to watch. Right. And, and so it's like, who cares if you don't understand the science behind it or know that it's called a, a this or a that, or you've kind of morphed it into some other metaphor if you're getting the results, you're getting the results, right? And so I think, um, so it is possible. Um, it just depends on the organization and if they're ready for it and if they have people that are eager to like experiment and are they, are they giving people the the time to, to, to be good facilitators, right? Because let's say someone's interested in doing this, then, um, uh, are they overloaded with lots of other tasks? They literally don't have time to prepare and grow and into the role. And another thing to be careful of is a lot of times organizations will kind of like see the role as, um, you know, not, they, they don't, um, they kind of discount the role, if you will. And they sometimes hand it off to someone junior, but then that creates a weird dynamic because the junior person's less, not gonna be in a position to, uh, be assertive with leadership and ideally your facilitator can really lean into conflict because if a facilitator is not leaning into conflict you're you're not really going to go to to really important places and, a lot, and we really need to go in into that stuff and through it to like make progress versus tiptoeing around it and just like okay let's 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 just leave that in the corner and we'll just talk about this over here right so anyway, I know that was a lot, but um, I, I do think that um, it's possible for the right organizations, but it, requ it requires like a respect for the craft and, um, and, and the right training, whether or not someone's um, seeking that out and like 
just because they're hungry to do it or you know the organization's investing in it i've seen both work it just depends on the who's there and and what's going on excellent any other questions any, anybody have anything else before we adjourn Hello, Douglas. My name is Emmanuel. Hey there. Yeah, thanks so much for this opportunity. I, I want to ask, um, when you're planning a meeting and you've been able to schedule the meeting maybe a month ahead, and then you're supposed to send out agenda, how soon do you think the agenda should go out? Should it go out maybe two weeks to when the meeting is, uh, the workshop or the meeting is coming up or um one week like i have a workshop which i'm planning for wednesday and i'm stuck here because i want to do the mural presentation to the uh the demands team but i've not sent out the agenda right so i'm thinking uh sending it out tomorrow it seemed a bit late but i think maybe two or three days is still there for them to see the purpose and i'm glad i'm attending this session with you because it just gives me some idea to put around what the purpose of the meeting will be thank you yeah yeah for sure um so a few things one i i don't think there's any specific like oh the agenda has to go out exactly this many days or anything like that um i would i think it really matters more around how much preparation how much notice you think people need based on what you're going to do um if you think that um, I'm not a huge fan of homework. So if we're, cause a lot of times people just don't do it, but sometimes my, my favorite way to do homework is like to plant a seed of an idea. Cause if someone's walking around with some, something their their subconscious is processing it. Right. And maybe that's all I need is for them to come having already like thought about that thing for a little bit. Um, and often if you give homework and people don't have time to do it, that you just create an anxiety for them. And now, and they're feeling inferior, feeling like, oh, I didn't do that. And now like, what's going to happen? Is he, is he going to maybe call on me and I'm not, I don't have it. You know? <laughs> so it's like, so it's like just asking someone to simply think about this concept of this topic, very powerful because like, even if they do it, even if they don't think they're doing it, they're doing it. Right. Cause you planted that seed. And like, so they're going to be chewing on it. Um, and so you just got to think about like any of that stuff whether or if it's simply like you know, sometimes you might want them to like check out um you know they might need to go visit a plant or mm -hmm. they might need to go you know visit a store or look at some metrics in a system you know maybe some very simple things that you're and, and how much time do they need to do that and how much notice they need those are things that are important to think about um uh, if they're going to be planning travel or or, or coordinating anything like that um, if, um, if we're having any kind of orientation or expectation setting activity before the session, you know, I'm just thinking about those kinds of sequencing. Yeah. And then also the, um, as the other thing I think is really important to consider is how much to share with them. Okay. Because I think sometimes, um, sharing a, a de often sharing a detailed agenda can backfire on you because, oh. um, people get hung up on the, the mechanics. And if we, and if, if we're in the moment and we realize we don't need to do like step three, or you want to replace step three with something else, or we're running low on time, but the team's like, really like, it's just magic happening in the room, but mm -hmm. and you're just letting that magic happen. And you're like, Oh, we don't even need exercise three because the whole point was to build more magic and magic's like way more than I need. Like it's, it's, it's going off like firecrackers. Um, so I'm going to just remove this activity and it's all going to, it's all going to be fine. Well, if sometimes participants will see you skip something and they'll get all, all worried about it, you know, especially if they're, there's some, there, there's somehow like your, um, your main point of contact and like you've done this thing for them. So uh, there's a, there's an art to like how much you give them. So they feel confident. They have like a, a an arc. And, a, and, and an agenda but not so much that it, you don't if you're making moves and changing stuff they're not alarmed um 
And also that gives you, the nice thing about that too, is you can share it earlier because even if you don't have stuff totally locked in, you might already kind of understand your general arc and you can just share that. We, and we call that the, the notion of the, this idea of a, a basic agenda versus yeah. an annotated agenda. And the annotated, I certainly don't share them. Like my annotated agenda is down to the level of like, is my, what's my assistant doing? What supplies do I need? Like, how am I transitioning from this or that? Like, am I in groups of two or three or whatever? They don't need to know any of that stuff. Yeah. Um, and so I try to like really get, would give them something simple. And to your point, the purpose is m- the main important thing. If they understand the purpose and the arc, they're generally pretty happy. Oh. Thanks so much, Douglas. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. Well, any other questions before we call it a day? All right. I hope you have an amazing day and go out and have some magical meetings. You too. Thanks so much, Zatas. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Bye.